Welcome to another edition of the Metal Voice. Today we are celebrating the 30 year anniversary of Fist Full of Metal by Anthrax. And who better to help us celebrate Fist Full of Metal is Mr. Neil Turbin, the original, the first singer of Anthrax. Neil, how's it going? Awesome, Jimmy and Giles. Thanks for having me. It's great to be on board. Also on the show, <laughs> we have Giles Lavery, all the way in Germany. <laughs> hey, Giles. What's happening, Jimmy? What's happening, Neil? Good to be here. Hey, what's up there, Giles? I just saw you over there at Headbangers Open Air the, the riot, when Riot was playing. We were just hanging out backstage like a week ago. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. And that was, that was real cool to see you. It was great to hang. And, man, didn't Riot kick some ass that night? Oh, definitely. It was a, a thrill to be on the same bill with them because I've been a fan for so many years. They've been a great, a big, a huge influence of mine. And, you know, there's great guys in the band and the current version of Riot. And, of course, you know, the history of the band and being from New York and all. So, I mean, a yeah. band I grew up, grew up on. And, uh, you know, the guys are so cool and they write great, you know, their music is still great and kicking ass better than ever. And, you know, they're going stronger than before. I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's a. Unfortunate that Mark Reale is not with us, um, but his music certainly is, and the band is going strong, and they sound great. I mean, it's it's fun to have had the opportunity to finally play on a bill with them, you know. Getting into Fistful of Metal, let's talk about the promotion, the recording, the songwriting, and just a little bit of a note here. I was 16 years old, Neil. I picked up this album, Fistful of Metal by Anthrax. I heard it on late night radio, and just so everybody knows. This was the only album by Anthrax at the time, and I, I thought it was ferocious. It just kicked so much ass. It defined the, that 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 sort of the beginning of the thrash movement. So, how did the songwriting process take place? Was it you alone? Or was it you working with the rest of the band, or was it something that you brought in with you from, you know, from an older band? The songwriting process. There really wasn't per se a process there was you know Dan Loker who actually came up with most of the riffs on the music side so he actually would write riffs and he and Scott would you know kind of work through it a bit and play it together and you know it was kind of like um, neighbor a neighborhood kind of thing because they lived near right near each other so they would get together and Sure. kind of buddy up and do that sort of thing so that was kind of the the dynamics of the group and then greg walls who was the lead guitar player the original lead guitarist for anthrax he was also not too far away he wasn't right in the neighborhood but he wasn't too far away and um i, I was close you know to, yeah. to both danny and scott where i was um, ge geographically located at the time in, the, in queens and uh, so they would get together, and at the very early stages, you know, I was, I was, you know, engaging with with both Danny and Scott. You know, we get together a little bit, and um, you know, just different worlds. You know, completely different worlds. And in terms of trying to sit down and write, I, I don't think that they quite had a. I don't think any of us really, as a collective uh, group, had a process per se. So. It was more or less, here's here's the riffs, right? Yeah. Here's, here's the riffs, here you go. So I think that in the early stages, you know, they had these songs that were kind of immature. And I'm not saying that to, um, you know, put down anyone. I'm saying it just from a standpoint of, you know, early on, you know, when I joined the band, they, you know, I had to do a show within two weeks. Oh, so wow. the songs, some of the songs were kind of like, you know, very leaning towards Iron Maiden a lot. Yeah or other very blatant influences and it was just it was just like not they weren't comfortable to sing some of the songs some of it wasn't great for vocals where the kind of where the where it was placed vocally and you know the keys and the just the way it was written so what 
I was looking for was something that, you know, would kind of take it to the next level or a few levels up. In, in my case with Anthrax, I, I would say that um, they, here's a riff and here you go. You know, they weren't going to change it or do anything with it. They were kind of set in their ways. Here, here it is. Go figure it out. So what I did is I took those riffs and I made them into a lot more than riffs. You know, and, and the, the connecting the vocal parts, you know, where, I mean, I had an idea of the framework, but I, I brought that further together. And of course, the melodies for all the vocals, all the songwriting uh, ideas, like the titles of the songs and all that, that, that was all for me. And um, all of the ideas for, um, you know, the lyrical content, that was all mine. And that would be, you know, the key songs on that album Metal Thrash Mad, uh, Death Rider, you know. Soldiers of Metal, Panic, um, and the song Anthrax, Death from Above, Subjugator. Those are all songs I wrote, as well as, of course, you know, songs that uh, were used afterwards, which um, you know I was completely responsible for writing and co-writing with, collaborating with the band, and writing, you know, fifty percent. But the way that um, royalties work and the way that things ended up is, I'm I'm only getting like 10% or 20%, you know, it's a very minimal amount, like on Armed and Dangerous, which I, you know, wrote 50% of that song. I'm going to tell you, I was 16 years old, and getting back to this, I would have never picked up the album if you weren't singing on that album. How long did it take you to lay down the vocals? I had very little time to do it because the band, you know, if you look at 30 days to record, you know, I was, up, I was in upstate New York for, uh, in Cortland, for um, about a month, sure. and I was there for about three weeks. They came up and you know started recording the album and the drums and the guitars and the bass, and they took most of the time for that and mixing. And the vocals had a total of probably about less than three days. It was like two days and a little bit of change. And that's crazy. Crammed into a, a very short time, and I feel from that standpoint, you know, it didn't give me the opportunity to to get the, my best performance. I had some you know, good performances on a, on a few of the tracks, but in terms of what I was truly capable of at that point, I really got shortchanged on that. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of bands can tell you stories about, hey, you know, we didn't have a lot of time. But maybe that's what made the vocals so great on the album. It's, you know, it's, it's very punky, it's, it's, you know, it's dynamic and it's ferocious. And maybe that's what came across because you had such little time to do it in. You know, it, say, it kind of worked out in your favor. I would say it's not the case because, you know, I think as musicians, you know, we're all perfectionists to a certain point. Sure. And I think that, um, you know, my objectives were to, you know, deliver accurate notes and accurate performance and, you know, very inspired performance. What was going through your mind as you were laying down the track for Metal Thrashing Mad? What was going through, you're in the studio, you just, you're very limited time and you got to pull this, pull this off. What was going through your head? Well, with that track particularly, I, I couldn't really pinpoint that. I think if I if I flash back on that, it would really be, um, you know, the delivery of certain songs where I just you know felt like I hit it in the you know I hit I hit it out of the park or I just you know I, that's it I knocked it out of the park. I think on that particular song, yeah. I remember being in the studio and I know that um, John Johnny Z was listening to these songs while we were up in the studio. He was there for part of the time. And he was up there when I was doing vocals, if I recall correctly. And I think at that point, you know, there were some interesting comments made. And, yeah. you know, he, he, of course, managed Metallica at the time and, you know, talked about, oh, well, you know, maybe we should get you to sing for Metallica or something like that. And I'm like, you know, no, that's all right. Thanks, though. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, you is know, that, is, did he actually say that? I guess he must have been impressed with something. You know, in the studio, I think Johnny Z heard that and I think it was... You know, I'm sure Carl Kennedy and Johnny Z, they were, you know, they were like, whoa, you know, this is, um, this, this I don't know is if it. affecting it or not or, or what, but, uh, you know, there was just some talk like, wow, this could, you know, he was just thinking out loud. I don't, I'm not saying that I was offered any gigs with, uh, no, 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 it's understood. It's understood. Yeah, yeah. The, the you know. term metal thrashing mad, was that the first time the word thrashing or thrash metal? Uh, was brought into the sort of metal world. I'm not going to make any claims, but all I can say is that in print, yeah, in Kerrang! magazine, Malcolm Dome and Xavier Xavier Russell, Xavier, well, 
they uh, reviewed a couple of albums. One of them was Violence and Force, and then um, Fistful of Metal was also in that same issue. So what they did is they first reviewed um, Fistful of Metal, and when they were when Malcolm Dome, I, I, you know, I think Xavier Russell reviewed one, and then Malcolm Dome reviewed the next one, and then Malcolm Dome, he actually um, he was kind of making a re re reference to the Fistful of Metal album and the metal thrashing mad, so the metal thrashing genre or the thrashing metal genre, or you know, it was kind of like that. And that's the first time that I ever heard it and I ever saw it in print. But, but you know what? I, I think there's been much said about you know where you know the term thrash came from. You know, there's been there's been many you know Kerry King, you know, and there's been so many different people saying you know it came from here, it came from yeah, there. Yeah. But one one thing is I do not remember any song or any you know like like Neil was saying in print a song called Metal Thrash and Mad. Yeah. We could sit here all day and analyze where the word thrash came from. <laughs> it's true. Uh, I, I I don't rem I don't I don't remember any other band having a song you know thrash this thrash that Metal Thrashing Mad. In my opinion, was the first time that phrase was was used in, you know in print as neil said really to c capture you know where did metal thrashing mad come from i came up with metal because that was uh you know obviously uh what we're doing right and then thrashing you know because we're thrashing you know we're we're thrashing and kicking and screaming <laughs> and, um, and then you know it was madness so <laughs> I, I just came up with metal thrashing mad as a title and you know, if you want to look at other songs that I I wrote and that I put the title on, Hard and Dangerous, you know, Gung Ho, those were all great songs, like creations lyrically and, and from a composition standpoint of the idea. Of course, there was riffs that other people had contributed, but you know, that was the core of what I wrote, and um, I just feel like the cool thing about it is that that's how that song was written, and you know, what's interesting is I've read interviews with other members. Uh, in the, you know, of, of the band, and I don't know that they had any idea how it was written or why or you know what it actually meant. And by the way, yes. Jimmy, that was my idea for the guy on the cover of Fistful of Metal getting his piece face punched out through his mouth. So it was a great idea, but that was my idea, and um, I'm actually surprised they took my idea. But but they they called the next album Hard and Dangerous, so I guess uh, you know my idea. Ended up, <laughs> on the front of the cover. It was, it was a crazy cover. I mean, the artist kind of, you know, was responsible for what he drew, but the idea was definitely, you know, aggressiveness and fierceness. So I think that's that, that that's what the album spoke, I think, by, you know, by virtue of putting it on your turntable. And for an artist, I mean, there's also a sense of accomplishment, right? And uh, here you are, you, 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 you were a big part of this album. Was, a lot of this album was you. You walk into the record store and there you see, you know, the, the, the cover. I mean, how did you feel when you first, I made it? I mean, how did you feel when you first saw that album in a record store or somewhere else for that matter? I thought it was cool that uh, it was out in record stores when vinyl was uh, away, you know. And I never really had a chance to, to feel like the, the wow factor, oh wow, you know, I've got an album. Yeah, you know, it was a cool feeling in that respect. and. But, but there really wasn't a lot of time to feel like, oh, we're, you know, we've accomplished this or we've accomplished that. It was just, you know, getting out there and playing shows and trying to manage the situation. And it just seemed like the bigger stuff we did, like playing, you know, tour or playing Roseland, you know, the more things got spun out of control. And, you know, it was, it was not so much me doing anything. Because really, you know, if you really want to boil it right down to the nitty gritty, it's like, well, what, what did I actually do? What did I do for people to hold grudges against me? You know, sure. we just didn't. You know, there just wasn't a synergy. There just wasn't. There wasn't a good connection between us. You know, I think that's one factor, and, and the people were just extremely jealous. It's like, you know, talk about lead singers that have issues. Well, what do you call it when, you know, someone who's not a lead singer has lead singer's disease? Neil, if you had to pick a favorite track off of Fistful of Metal. Which one would it be and why? Well, that's a hard one um, for me because, you know, they're all my babies. You know, I wrote them and, um, you know, there's there's reasons why I like certain tracks more than others. I would say that 
you know, because of, um, I mean, Death Rider, I really like that one because, you know, of what I wrote it about, it was, you know, Greek mythology and Pegasus and, you know. I know a lot about that. The Greek uh, mythological go gods and just, you know, and that kind of uh, tenacity and, sure. and fierceness. I, I think that, I think it came across really well. It was just executed well. Well, what I, what I thought was great was on um, Metal Thrashing Mad, of course, and Death Rider, I thought were probably the two strongest tracks for me personally on the album. But I felt like, you know, songwriting-wise, they were strong songs as yes. well as, you know, the vocal delivery. And, you know, of course, part of that is, you know, having having the screams be accurate, having the, the lyrical delivery, the, the um, inflections, the overall, um, you know, delivery and, and just accents and all that back in the day of tape you know when we were doing it sure analog before it was digital so just being able to get that across and have it you know really come across because those are really great songs i felt like you know they came across well it's too bad they recorded the whole album in a dumpster charles i have a question for you on fistful of metal what is your favorite track and why that's you know, fine. for me, I, I gotta, I gotta pick Death Rider, and I gotta pick Metal Crash and Mad. I mean, I, you know, I, okay, I could also say Panic. I could also say I could run off most of the album here, but I think, I think Death Rider, Metal Crash and Mad, and why? Why? Because when I first bought that record and I chucked it on, that that's what grabbed me immediately, and that's what grabbed me right away with those two songs. I mean, they were they were the front, front end of the album. That didn't hurt either, but they just they grabbed me. So I'll pick those two. And I'm going to tell you mine, okay? I think uh, it's okay. a Metal Thrashing Mad because it was the first song I ever heard and it just grabbed my attention right away, like you said. And Death From Above. And I'll tell you why Death From Above. But my friends and I, we used to gather around, you know, at parties and such. And we used to put the song on and we'd wait for the middle part when you're hitting that, I don't know if it's a G or a, a C, that, that high, the high note you do there, Neil. Uh, I think it's an E5. <laughs> I mean, we just sit around and wait for that note. And we just, you know, we just laugh out of joy, you know, laugh out of joy because it was so great. Neil, what was the coolest thing a fan ever told you about the album Fistful of Metal? Other than what I just said before. What was the coolest thing? You know, it's neat to be able to hear that, you know, people, it, it influenced people, especially people that are, you know, very successful musicians today. So I think, you know, that's, that's pretty cool to have respect from people that, are in bands that are out there playing and that say, hey, you know, that, that album or the, those songs influenced me in some way. I think that's, you know, a great honor. Walk me through how, you know, either you how you parted ways. I mean, were you let go? Did you quit? Was it a combination of both? What happened there? It was a very damaged relationship at that point after the tour and after playing Roseland. Oh. It's kind of like we climbed the mountain and now we don't like each other, we don't talk to each other, I mean, there's no communication, zero. And then the phone rings, okay, let's try to rehearse next week. So kind of, that was the culture and it's like, it was more like work than it was fun. And it was more noisy than it was dynamic. Um, so really that was the past behavior. So after that show at Roseland, it was like, you know, okay, it was bad. It was like, I'm not traveling with these guys. I wasn't staying in the same hotel. I mean, there was definitely huge animosity, and I think that there was other people, there was a photographer, and I won't name names, but there was a photographer that was talking a bunch of smack, saying, Neil's saying this, Neil's saying that, so he was telling that to the band at the time. This is something that, that kind of filtered out later through the, you know, that, that filtered to me from, you know, very good sources. So, in other words, he was close to the band, he, he did a bunch of photography for the band. He said a bunch of stuff to the band. Oh, Neil said this, Neil said that. So there was a lot of this jabbing going on. And, you know, basically you had people that were jealous of me in the first place. And then, you know, once you add that to the mix that, oh, Neil said this, Neil said that. I was holding on longer than I, I should have to right. capsizing. So I, I just looked at it from a standpoint that, you know, well, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a quitter and I don't give up on stuff. So that's really where I was coming from. But as far as the relationship, that was, it was trashed. It was done. It was, you know, well, well overdone. Stick a fork in it. Yeah. So I, I was, you know, it wasn't because for any other reason, just to try to, I mean, it was unfamiliar territory for me. You know, I was a young person just trying to, you know, find my way. And I didn't, I wasn't exposed to narcissism 
like there was at the time. I mean, these folks were extremely sociopathic and narcissistic. I had no idea that that's what was under the hood. I, I just never dealt with people like that. And, you know, I try to avoid toxic people like like it's lepers, man. I, I just run the other way. So I, I don't, you know, I wasn't prepared for that. And that's what it was. I never saw a, I never saw a dime one when I was in the band, not a penny. So being in the band, that was one of the pressing factors in my case because you know I'd been in the band for two full years, yeah, and I hadn't seen a penny. So nothing. They wouldn't give you meal money or traveling money. Nothing. Oh, there Hotels? was nothing extra. It was bare bones on the road. It was you know one one meal at Denny's or something, and then you know. What about was, Scott like, and the rest of them? Did they get paid? Like I had huge requirements, but there was no money. Like they sold merch. Yeah. Selling a lot of merch. They were, you know, I mean, I was part of the band originally, and yeah, you know, after when I left the, the group, I mean, there was no merch. You know, in other words, they, the way things went down, it wasn't pretty, and um, you know, I was foolish in the sense that there wasn't any anything protecting me in the contract that would have said, okay, well. You know, you should have a, a piece of the merch. I mean, I helped put the band on the map. Of course, you know, you know they've been quite successful afterwards, so there's no denying that or taking that away from them in any respect. But, but that was one of the things about being, you know, working with Johnny Z and, and Scott. I mean, all the attention of the band business all went to Scott. I mean, I was kept out of the loop, so I never felt like I was even in the band. You saw yeah. Joey get on stage and do your material. He's singing the songs that you sang and wrote. How did you feel? I, I didn't feel that there was any anger. I just felt like, you know, I just I just went there to check it out, just to see what it sounded like. Yeah. And personally, you know, I thought that, yeah, you know, he, he got up on stage and, you know, I wasn't expecting that, that he wouldn't get up on stage and, you know, do a decent job. That wasn't even a, a question. You know, I don't, I don't think a band like that's going to get someone who can't sing or can't play, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, were you happy for him? About, I think it's all about uh, style and preference. I think as a singer, yeah, it's just not someone I would listen to just from the sound of his voice. Like if they had Paul Rogers in the band, I, I, would, I couldn't deny that I would love his voice. Okay. I couldn't deny that if it was Glenn Hughes singing that I would love the voice. But personally, I just, you know, there was, a, there was too much... I don't know, it was a lot of wavering sounds in the voice to me. It was just not a voice that that I personally, I thought it was, you know, just kind of, even the direction of the music became a lot more kind of goofy to me. I, I don't know, I, I like stuff like Accept. I like, you know, I read a listen to the Creator and Destruction. If you had to pick between John Bush and Joey, who would you, what would be your preference of, as a singer? Or or the the style of music that Anthrax was in? The John Bush era or the Joey Belladonna era? Um, well, if I had to choose, I would choose Dan Nelson. <laughs> much cooler guy. I met Dan, and he was, uh, you know, he was he was very number three. Apparently, and you know, I met him with Frank Bella. So I mean, I was talking to both of them. Not you know, probably in the last whenever Dan was in the band. If you had to pick one Anthrax album that you thought was man, that's a great album that they made. Which one would it be? From a, a business standpoint, or from you know a career standpoint, I would say probably Anthrax's last album, you know, was probably worship you know, music. Yeah, one in the what you know a step in the right direction. I want to move to um, what you're doing now, the album. I know that you've been working on this album for quite a while, maybe a few years. Tell us what you're doing. What is this album going to sound like? What direction are you heading in? And what are the next steps? For Neil Turbin sure. and Death Riders. With Death Riders, you know, there's definitely you know, high notes and screaming, but there's also great songwriting and melody. And I have a, a writing partner with Jonas Hornfist out of Sweden. You know, we've written for 10 years together. I think that one of the, the thoughts that um, I had with Death Riders is that you know you hold it up, the quality of the song and the the you know the song has got to be able to hold up to um, you know metal thrashing mad or Death Rider or a song on that level. So. If it doesn't hold up to that, I just say, let's toss it in the can, you know, move on. And then I have a, 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 another band that's called Bleed the Hunger with Jonas and I. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's some new tracks that are out there actually on SoundCloud if you want to check that out. Great. But um, if you haven't already. And I think that, you know, it's pretty cool because it's a hard rock band. You know, it's 
it's in a different direction so it gives us the opportunity to you know play stuff that we didn't really have a home for when we were writing these songs and it's like well this doesn't really fit death riders you know i think with death riders i've played more shows than with any other band i've accomplished more you know i've played more places around the world you know i've played you know in in, in mexico and in japan and europe you know many numerous times to different countries played you know in the united states um you know still play cool places and you know, some of my best concerts and best work is, is with Death Riders, so I'm very proud of, of you know, doing what I'm doing, and um, I think that the opportunity for, for me is bright, and the, the future is bright, and, um, you know, we just signed a, a, a management and booking deal with um, yep, EAM, yeah, Agent yeah. or EAM, with Frank Vetter over in, in Germany and Europe. And with Death Riders, we're recording the album now. Where can fans reach you? On the web, on the internet, I can be reached at deathriders.com. Yeah. So that's our that's the website. You know, we have merch at deathriders.com forward slash store. Yeah. And we also, you know, you can send me a direct email uh, at info at deathriders.com. So I'm gonna I'm gonna close things off here. Thank you very much for being a guest today, Neil. Thank you for uh, celebrating 30 years of fistful of metal by Anthrax and of course Neil Turbin. Giles, thanks for uh, joining us on the call today. And we're out of time. <laughs> we're out of batteries. <laughs> well, thanks. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Neil. It's, it's, and, and thank you for not sugarcoating anything. <laughs> that was a really, really cool interview. Brutally honest, the way it should be.